All right, good morning, South by Southwest. What day is it? Sunday? Yeah. Can we get a good morning, South by Southwest? All right, all right, all right, all right. Good morning. Okay, okay. Hey, I'm Ryan Linder. I'm Executive Vice President and Global Chief Marketing Officer for Stagwell. For those, amen, sister. For those who may not know, Stagwell is home to over 70 of the most creative, strategic, innovative agencies on the planet. Uh, been here for the balance of a decade. I can say that with the utmost confidence. They are some of the best. Two of which are here today. NRG, National Research Group, and Around, that sits within the Stagwell Marketing Cloud. The rest of the Stagwell family includes agencies like 72 and Sunny, Anomaly, Chris Porter Bogusky, Assembly Media, Gale, the list goes on. So today, I'm wearing a Minnesota Twins baseball cap. Yeah, you are. Yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> We're here to talk about the power of fandom, the anatomy of a fan, right? And at South by Southwest, we're surrounded by fans of all kinds, music, sports, brands, bands, you name it. Anybody see Wu-Tang Clan and Raekwon last night at the group Black Party? What? I'm the only one. Left my voice there. Is that real? <laughs> right? Um, Is that so real? I got the Minnesota Twins, I've got the Wu-Tang Clan, it's South by Southwest has been treating this fan very, very good. And of course, our friends at, uh, at Stagwell. But look, if you think about a fan in the context, in this context, it evokes visions of people in ballparks eating hot dogs. Cracker Jacks, a person in a crowd at a concert singing along to every lyric of their favorite Wu-Tang song. Um, a line stretching around a city block for a sneaker drop at Foot Locker. The virtual line at StockX for that same drop being hours long and sometimes you don't even get in. The talk we're here to bring you today is all about the power of that kind of fandom. Specifically the anatomy of a fan and how to harness the loyalty, insights, and emerging technology that comes along with it. And I jumped at the opportunity to get in on this party for two reasons. And it didn't just start today. It didn't start last month. Fatula, you have been leading some incredible research for the balance of the last three to four months that we premiered for the first time at Super Bowl in Arizona just last month. So the power, well, sorry, as I mentioned, my hometown team is the Minnesota Twins. My man Chris Isles is in the building, Senior Director, Innovation and Growth at the Minnesota Twins Baseball Club joining us here today, and that's some of the fandom standing right here on this stage. Stagwell Research Powerhouse National Research Group has been exploring the idea of fandom when it comes to brands and how they can successfully build and activate the fan community. The common denominator in fandom, whether it be music, entertainment, or with brands, is what? It's culture. It's an engagement within a community built around a shared appreciation, social connection, and identity. And today, we're going to unpack the anatomy of a fan and explore how brands can harness the incredible power of fandom in innovative and engaging ways. There is nothing I would rather do with the power of the microphone three inches from my mouth than recite some of my favorite lyrics, but I'll refrain. So I'm going to tell you all who's on stage here today. I told you about Chris from the Minnesota Twins Baseball Club. Give it up. Hey. Thank you. Josh Beatty could be one of the smartest cats we have in our 14,000 person network. The mind, the architect, the inventor of some incredible AI and AR based technology called Around that he's launched in, in partnership with the Minnesota Twins. Josh Beatty, founder and CEO of Around, give it up. My good friend, Fatula Damascos, EVP, Brand Strategy, Innovation, National Research Group, give it up. And this thing is not going down without a moderator with a much healthier voice than me at the moment. <laughs> Evan Novi Williams, sports business reporter at Sportico. Give it up, guys, over to you. Bring a leg. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Chris, if you need an MC at, uh, at Target Field, uh, I, think you, I think you've got your, uh, think your next our, guy here. Our next one. Um, I, I'm really excited. Thank you guys all for being here. Excited to, to share the stage with, with all three of you uh, to discuss this topic. And, and guys, I've been, I've been bouncing around to different tracks this week uh, and was struck that it seems like everybody's having this same conversation in their own businesses, right? Legacy car companies want to reach consumers that care about electric. Musicians want to figure out where, where their consumers are and how they're buying music. Uh, and I think in different industries, it's at different levels of 
emergency, right? So, so I guess I'll start with this. In the sports world, are we DEFCON 4, not, not a huge deal? Are we at DEFCON 1? Where are we right now in trying to figure out what that next generation of consumers is uh, and where fans are gonna be in the next five or 10 years? I would say certainly from a marketing perspective, that is our, our group's highest charge and our highest priority is how do we not only identify but then engage and then convert the next generation of fans. Um, in baseball, a more traditional sport with, with traditionally a, a, a bit older audience, um, we've, we've got them. How do we use our marketing resources to go out and get the next generation and turn them into uh, baseball fans for life? Fatula, you, are, you talk with teams all the time, I imagine. Leagues also, people want data. You guys provide it. What are people asking you for? What, what, what are the questions that people need, need unlocked right now? Yeah, I mean, it's really around how do they, how do they identify fans? How do you activate that fan? And, and how do you kind of create those lasting relationships? Um, and what we've seen with, with fandom is just it's such a powerful relationship that once you establish it, it's lasting. And it, it, it takes a lot to break it. And it's a very... Um, you know, it's a relationship, it's symbiotic. Brands or sports teams give to fans and fans give it right back and it, it really comes down to emotion. You know, how do we create emotion with fans, whether it's a team or a brand? How do we create that spark, that connection between fans and between the brand? Um, and how do we like, create meaning around it? And that's a lot of what people are trying to figure out. How do you activate that community? How do you make people care? And Josh, that for folks who are not familiar with the round, that's kind of part of the question you're, you're, you're trying to answer, right? And hoping to help teams like, like the Minnesota Twins in, in solving. Um, give us a breakdown of actually what, what it is that you're doing and, and what it looks like in the, uh, in the stance. Appreciate it. So Around is a next-gen fan engagement platform really geared for the next generation of fans. Uh, we can localize individuals throughout a stadium with just their, just their smartphone and then bring them into a shared experience where everybody's seeing the same 3D effects and can participate in the same shared experiences. So as we think about the next generation, I mean, they are first digital native. They really want things that kind of blend that physical digital that they can be expressive and that they can create content that they can take ownership of. So that's kind of how we're thinking about this space. And there's a lot of layers that can be added, but it's really kind of going after the biggest challenge in sport, which is how do you engage that younger, more casual fan, especially when you're competing not with other sports, but with all of entertainment. Uh, early in my career, an NBA CEO, I think it was Rick Welts of the Golden State Warriors, told me that the, his most avid and most valuable fans were also the cheapest ones for, on his books. And the idea there, Chris, being that there's a 65-year-old woman in Maple Grove, Minnesota, who loves the Twins. She goes to four or five games a year. She watches another 100 on TV. There's not much that you need to do to, to get her in for next season, right? She, she's already in. Uh, and that's a really valuable fan, but is also one that you don't need to work that hard for. And that the inverse is also true. The ones that are kind of teetering on the edge, maybe fans and may not, those are the ones that are actually the most expensive because there's all this stuff that you guys need to do to try to reach that person. I'm curious if that resonates with, with you guys at all, if that, if that seems like that kind of dichotomy between most valuable fans are cheaper and the, the, the ones that are even harder to get are the, are the ones that are more expensive. Yeah, I would say uh, the most valuable fans, uh, everything that we do in Ballpark is, is catered towards that fan. We no doubt need to, uh, we need to provide that fan with an incredible experience so we don't lose them. Um, but it, we don't necessarily need to be using our marketing resources to attract that fan. We've got them for life. Uh, we don't ever want to do anything to alienate them. But when we think about where we're going to put our resources, particularly from a marketing perspective, um, it is geared towards that younger fan that is maybe teetering on, on the brink of fandom, we're never going to get the person who is never going to be a baseball fan, so we don't worry about them. Um, we don't necessarily worry about the super fan because we've got them. Um, what we're trying to get is the person that we could convert into a fan, a person who is younger um, and is going to provide us with a high lifetime value. That's where we're going to put our resources all day, every day. Walk us through how Around and the Twins got, got together. What, was the, what connected you and, and, and how did that partnership grow? Do you want to start, Josh, or should I? 
Go for it. Yeah, so um, so Josh is incredibly forward thinking, uh, was able to, through uh, our friends at Stagwell, get funding for what I think is a, a pretty amazing idea. Um, he came to us early on knowing that we're pretty active and involved in the, the technology space um, and said, look, this is this is my idea. This is what I'm working on. It's it's augmented reality that is not an isolating experience. So I think, I think the limiting factor to date in augmented reality is that it is an isolating experience. It's a user on your phone. Um, it's kind of one and done. Once I've done it, I don't need to see it again. And what Josh was selling uh, was a shared experience through AR by which, you know, Fatula could participate alongside me and I could be aware of her in it. Uh, and we're seeing the same experience at the same time. So basically, uh, you know, stadium scale shared AR, which uh, no one had been able to figure out. I've, I've, you know, been scouring the space trying to figure something out. Uh, and in comes Josh and tells me he's got it figured out. By the way, he doesn't have a product yet. It's just an idea. Yeah, right. Um, and so, so uh, I'm like, yeah, this guy's kind of crazy, but you know, that's cool. I like it. Um, and and I'm like, what do you need? And pretty much, he's he's like, I, I need a space to start to build. Um, and sure, no skin off my nose. I'll let you into Target Field. You can build. We're not we're not putting anything out in front of the public. Um, and and throughout the course of a year, watching Josh build, um, we eventually got to a point where it was like this is this is an MVP that we we could put in front of the public. Um, and and we ultimately ended up doing that in in August of last year and launched it to to great fanfare with some awesome coverage from our friends at Sportico, um, some awesome coverage from from a variety of publications and um, and it was really one of uh, honestly it was one of the coolest things that we did for our fans all year um, and you know I can I can let you Josh talk a little bit more about what the experience was um, but that that is uh, in essence an abbreviated version of the the origin story of around AR. Great. Uh, I mean, we see shared AR as a way to connect with the world around you, to bring people together, and to really have these shared communal experiences. Uh, the one thing that we knew is that we really had to fit into these situations. We couldn't come in with our own idea and say, this is the way it is, enjoy it. It was more of how can we augment and amplify the action on the field? How can we take that energy around the stage, stadium and make people feel a part of it? Um, and so it's you know, with the twins, is really working closely to figure out first who the core audience is for this product, what are the biggest challenges, and really how we could deliver that. Um, what we realized with the twins is their big challenge is with younger fans. How can you educate and entertain them and drive that high engagement? And what we found with the twins is, you know, we could create follow-along features so the kids are paying attention alongside their parents. They can participate. They can gamify. And at the end of the day, they're creating connections not just with the stadium, but with their family, with the team. And between that 7 and 11 year old, I mean, that's when fandom really ignites. And that's what we're trying to do and provide those lifelong fans for teams. So I have a hot take that I'll share with you guys. Ooh, I actually probably shouldn't say it's a hot take because I think you guys may agree. Uh, anyone out there, did, did, did you guys see the viral photo uh, of Phil Knight watching LeBron James break the NBA scoring record a couple months ago? See a lot of nods out there. Uh, for those of you who didn't, the, the moment that LeBron broke the, the NBA's all-time scoring record, Phil Knight was sitting courtside just watching, you know, arms folded watching, and literally every fan around him, phone out, is both watching and recording. Um, and I, at least in my circles, I feel like a lot of people looked at that and they were like, oh, Phil's got this right. Yeah. Right? Like, this is a problem right now. Um, and I actually, I, I feel differently about it, and I imagine maybe some of you guys do too. My feeling was that if, if you take a huge moment in sports, and you take a snapshot of 40 fans, and 39 of them are doing one thing, and one of them is doing another thing, it seems crazy to say that 39 of them are doing something wrong. Uh, how do you guys think about the, the, the phone, obviously integral to, to what you're doing, Josh, but, but when, when fans are in stands, how integral is it? Do you want them looking down? Do you want them looking up? What's the, how do you strike that balance? I'd say I think everybody in that photo was doing it right because, <laughs> because they were doing what they wanted to do. And, and that's, that's we got to meet people where they are. Um, you know, just, you know, being realistic about it, there's a little bit of downtime in a baseball game, right? Uh, any, anyone been to a baseball game here? There's a little bit of downtime. We've got a little bit of space to fill throughout the course of a game. Um, you know, 
per, you know, personally, one of the greatest moments I saw recently, uh, you know, in recent history on the field was was Joe Meyer, Joe Maurer's retirement when he yeah. came back out to catch one final uh, last pitch. I definitely did not have my phone out for that moment. There were plenty of people around me that did, um, and you know, whatever makes the moment more me- most meaningful to you is the right way to do it. But you know, on the team side, I've got to be able to meet uh, those people where they're at. Um, and, and I think, you know, what we've done in the AR space, what we've done in the VR space has, has allowed for that. I was at a Duke basketball game recently, at the beginning of this year, actually, uh, and they beat South Carolina Upstate by 45 points. Uh, but I was shocked at how few of the young fans there had phones out, right? The, it's obviously a very electric experience, and not to knock baseball, but I think it's, it's maybe a bit more exciting than an average baseball game. Um, but yeah, it, it struck me certainly how, how much of the fan, almost none of these 19 to 25 year olds uh, were on their phones, which I, I don't think you can get 2,000 people in that demographic doing anything, maybe except cheering for Duke that, that don't have their phones out. Uh, and and Fatuli, I, I'm curious, you guys do a lot of research around young fans demographically. Yeah. How, how different do you think about that cohort, right, yeah. versus people who are my age, people who are 80, yeah. whatever it is? Well, we actually, we have some research on um, people that, ha- that are experiencing digitally immersive experiences in events like sports, and we're seeing that they really do like that added engagement. It adds so much to their experience. Um, it creates kind of a deeper ex- experience. We just actually have something right off the press now, and we found that more than eight in 10 say that these digitally immersive experiences, whatever they may be, enhance the overall event for them, and they feel more connected to the brands that are part of it. So three out of four say they're more connected to whatever, um, whatever brand it might be or whatever team it might be when they have this kind of digital immersive experience. Um, and for them, it just creates more focus attention. They're more engaged in the the event, the, the sport, the, the, what they're watching, more so than if they didn't have that. And what they're really looking for is these new experiences. They want to see teams and brands bring these experiences to, to life in, in just like new and unique ways. And they want to discover, they want to understand um, new ways to experience product services teams. They want to find new ways to connect with other people like them, with other fans. And they want exclusive access to content and exclusive access to experiences. So and it's especially important for the, the younger consumers. We're seeing it as a true gateway to like 18 or 34 year olds in particular, where um, they actually say about just less than half say that they would prefer to experience an event in, through this digitally immersive event versus being in person alone. That, so, and, and it's vastly different when you talk to people older than 35. It's completely flipped. As someone who just turned 35, I realize I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> just graduated from the, the young no cohort of the, of the data group. set. Uh, that must be music to your ears, Josh, right? The, 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 a lot of the things that they're seeing seem to be kind of proof of concept for you guys. It is. I mean, everybody's right. Whatever people are doing, they're most comfortable with. Um, we view it as turning the uh, mobile device from a means of distraction to interaction in these events. I mean, right now, if someone's on their phone, they're pulled away from the event. What we can do is actually make them get pulled into it. And, you know, it's interesting. People come to stadiums to feel closer to the action, to the game, to the other fans, to the team. And with shared AR, we can actually remove these barriers and make people feel a part of the action. We can bring player personalities, make them larger than life, because you know, right now they're trapped under a helmet or in a dugout, and that's what people are paying to see is you know, these uh, incredible player properties, and teams want to really figure ways to invest and uh, stand them up. And we can make them as big and bold as possible, but then on the other side, we can make people take control of it. So it's, it's really thinking about how we can deliver the right experience for the right use case, which is different throughout sports, and different throughout audiences. Chris, I'm glad you're here representing the, the league and kind of team side uh, from baseball, because in my mind, baseball more than any other sport has this inherent tension going back decades between traditionalists and modernizers, right? More so than any other sport. How does that tension play out in your job? Do you, do you feel like you are often pushing idea, hey, we should try this, and that 
baseball traditionalists in your organization or fans of the Twins are pushing back. How does that tension work? Yeah, you know, that's that's a real interesting question, kind of a loaded one. Um, I, 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 I would say, yeah, I am always going to err on the side of we need to be pushing the, the envelope. I guess, I guess I am that voice on that side, that extreme. Um, there is always the other voice that says, yeah, this is a traditional sport. We need people keeping score uh, on paper and counting balls and strikes and watching every play. That's, I mean, that's the, that's the seam head, the other side of, of that. Um, so I view it as my job to be making messes on this end of the spectrum. So, you know, I, it takes the other end of the spectrum, the total seam head, and, and we're eventually going to meet in the middle um, is, is kind of how I see it. But again, um, you know, the total seam head is not wrong. That's how they like to enjoy the game. Who am I to say you should enjoy it any other way? Um, and, and at the same time, um, they should not, you know, tell the young fans this is how to enjoy baseball. Let a young fan enjoy baseball how they're going to enjoy it. Do you guys think you can go too far? I don't know if there's data that pops up so suddenly. That like, yeah, this, that, yeah, this is really interesting, actually. One of the things that we found early on is um, one of the biggest drivers, it was actually the number one driver of fandom, is this idea of innovation. And it, it basically means that if, if a, someone sees a brand um, as innovative, they're more likely to be a fan of that brand. Can you and say it, that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it really comes down to identity. Essentially, people, the fans, the people, the brands that people are fans of are a reflection of who they are. It's a reflection of who they want to be. Um, and there's this giant subculture of people that just want to be seen as leading edge. Like, they're, they're kind of onto the, the new trends. They're, they're um, you know, more, more leading edge than people, the other people they know. And so when they align with brands that are seen as innovative, it's a reflection of and, and how they project to others who they want to be. So they naturally gravitate to brands that are seen as more innovative and are being more innovative because that's kind of who they want to be as a person. So there is actually a really interesting psychological driver of all that um, that plays into it. And it, you know, you'll never ask a fan and, and they'll never say, oh yeah, I'm a fan of the twins because they're innovative, but subconsciously that's, that's what's pulling them into that brand as part of their identity. It's interesting, I, I'm glad you actually used the word subconsciously, because I was going to ask you, a, a lot of your, the, the data that you guys put together, I'm always curious about, I, I see data a lot about fans of you know, X and Y team are more likely to buy, we'll use the Twins for example, yeah. that a, 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 someone in Minnesota might be more likely to go to Target to get toilet paper because Target is a, is a, is a big partner of the Twins. Is that a subconscious thing? Is it just like, I, I see Target a lot because I walk into the stadium and I see the ads when I'm watching the Twins and, and, and subconsciously it pushes me that way? Or is some of this actually happening consciously where it's like, I need toilet paper and I'm gonna go to Target because Target supports the thing, the Twins, yeah. that I really like? Yeah, I think, I mean, both. I mean, some decisions are very conscious, but a lot of what um, drives us and connects us to brand is very much uh, kind of an, like I said before it's very emotional and all that is subconscious so it's about association how do you align with different subcultures as a brand um, so people feel like they're part of your community that they that they're part of this like belonging and, and are able to express our identity through the brands that they that they shop for shop with and support Josh, I imagine there's brands involved in your product in addition to kind of the fan-facing part of it. How, how do you think about that balance, right, between trying to build something just that fans want and also trying to build something that is kind of commercially opportunistic for a team or partner or things like that? Uh, we think that the most incredible thing about shared augmented reality is this concept of interactive storytelling where we can start to open up content to audiences to start to take control and ownership and to become part of it. Um, Kind of being the first in this space, you know, we're trying to stand up this category and show what the power is. Uh, but we believe that sponsors, they want to find ways to bring audiences in, to give them some control. And that's kind of what we're doing on a mass level. And so it, it is really interesting in terms of what can become of that. You know, instead of, you know, things that are just passive, they're much more interactive now. And, and that's kind of going to flip the paradigm, hopefully in terms of the value that can be created through these stories and how we can bring sponsorships to stadiums in a much richer way through these types of uh, mass engagements that aren't just a billboard, but really uh, a story that's unfolding that people are a part of and that they can share about. 
Hey, and Chris, to that point, when you're thinking about partners and, and, and doing something like what you're doing with a round, how much are you thinking about, oh, this is something my fans are going to love, or this is something that I can also monetize on, on the back end? I assume it's a little bit of both. But, that's, a, that's a great question. It is a little bit of both. And, and I think of those in terms of filters and, and priorities. And the number one priority is fan experience. The number two priority is business impact. Um, so I would say both of those weigh heavily when determining are we going to put resource behind something like this. Um, and and it, it is always fan first. It will always be fan first, um, but followed pretty closely by does this serve the business? You said something interesting right before we came on stage that I actually want to talk about out here. Sure. Twins ownership just just cycled over from older generation to younger generation. Yeah. Um, and we see very often that younger sports team owners, I think, have a different lens, a different approach. Uh, they, they may think differently about a lot of the topics that we're talking about than older fans would. Uh, yeah, I'm curious what that, what that experience has been like to transition there and, and, and what differences you actually see, specifically in your seat, which I feel like is probably very impacted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd say there's no doubt that, uh, that our, our new generation of ownership, which is, is the third generation of Polad ownership, um, has a penchant for innovation. They are very interested in making the Twins an innovative brand, and it's my charge to make the Twins the most innovative brand in sport. Like, no pressure, right? <laughs> um, so uh, so I, I would say that... Uh, that, that changeover has, has certainly had a significant impact in my role and how, how I do my job. I've, I've always had innovation and tech as a piece of what I'm doing, um, but with the next generation of ownership taking over, they said, you are now focused on this full time. We have a function dedicated to this and you're gonna build it out. Um, so uh, I would say it's, it's been very impactful in, in thinking about um, how we view our brand, not only as an innovative brand, but how we push our brand beyond baseball. We're, we're a, a middle America baseball team, um, and, and our new ownership is, is thinking about how do we elevate from just a baseball brand, uh, you know, just a symbol on a hat, to being you know, something greater, and we think innovation is a, one way to go about that. So Fatula, Josh, without naming names, or actually name names, please, I'm curious what your experience is like on the spectrum of different teams and leagues that you guys talk to, right? Are there, I imagine you talk to some who, who feel probably like the twins, that they, that they get it and they understand it and they want to be pushing the envelope here. And I would also imagine you talk to some who maybe don't really understand what the product is or, or don't see a need for it. Uh, I'm curious what that spectrum looks like in your experience. Go ahead. Great. Uh, it it's different by team. It's different by leagues. Um, it's what's the league difference, actually, real quick. Yeah, if you could just break it down real quick. I mean, it, careful, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think leagues are very traditional in nature. Um, they have a lot of different parts and products that they invest heavily in, and that they're really sensitive to protecting. So something like around, which is completely new. You know, first of all, there's no budget for around yet. I mean, there's no person within an organization that is really in charge of this type of nude layered experience. Um, and so it, it is first having to come in and show that we are delivering on a need, we are delivering value, and that we can deliver an opportunity that they can't get anywhere else. Um, that, that is resonating with teams. I mean, because they know that, it, you know, there, it, it is up to them to be driving fandom, excitement, and energy in all ways. Um, leagues, you know, I think that they definitely will come around. I mean, they know that a lot of their products are focused more on the core, older audience. Um, you know, this is a new era of fan engagement that really is primed for the next generation of fan who is already blending the physical and digital. And so they just want a means to be able to kind of take that and, and bring it to the different places that they're excited about. I, I, I can, I'll answer the first question. I, I didn't want to put you on the spot like that. I apologize. The, we talk a lot at Sportico about the NFL and how different the NFL approach is a lot of these things than other leagues, right? Because it has a massive commercial business. It has the flexibility and the financial comfort to not have to do the first thing, right? They can wait to see what everyone else does. And then if it works, great. The NFL will jump in. And if it doesn't work, okay, we didn't, we didn't, have, to waste, uh, didn't have to waste our time with it. Um, and I would imagine, Josh, for you that the, the, so much of this industry is copycat, right? And that if your product works, that eventually you'll hit a critical mass and then everyone will want to do it, right? Because it's working. And getting those first couple teams to be the one not to copy someone else, but to get out and, and do it first, that that's the, that that's the initial challenge. Um, 
It is, but we're at a really fun time. It's, it's finding the right team partners for us to be innovating with, to really understand the product fit within this, this space. Because what ha what's right for baseball is different for football, which is different for basketball, which is different for concerts and live entertainment. So it, us kind of being on the outside, you know, we, we can kind of come in with assumptions, but it's really understanding from the team level, you know, how this can play in. For example, with the Rams, you know, there's not downtime in football. Mm -hmm. But at SoFi Stadium, they have the best and most incredible infinity screen around. So it's more of how can we take our stadium augmented reality content, and it's, it still exists within the smartphone, but take it into a broadcast realm. And, you know, that wasn't a line of business that we were thinking when we moved into the Rams, but now it's incredible that we can disrupt the mixed reality broadcast industry through our, our workflow, something that is super expensive and really only meant for advertising in a lot of space we can make and make it relevant to every fan in, in this. Chris, Josh has mentioned a, 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 a LED screen, right, in, in, in SoFi. I know that the twins are in the process of installing, putting in a new one. Uh, I don't know how involved you are in that process, but I imagine having that new technology, right, being able to refresh the biggest screen in the stadium is something that gives you a lot of options that didn't exist with a smaller screen, that, that every time you do those tech innovations, it suddenly opens the door for more things in, in, in your world. Yeah, absolutely. It gives us a, 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 a brighter palette to play with. Uh, uh, if you will, um, and and you know it allows us to do greater, smarter integrations with different types of technology as well. Fatula, do you do you in your data do you see a difference? Uh, there's obviously differences between fans of different l leagues, but but how much do you think about you know specific brand categories and and whether they play better in in this bucket versus that bucket? Yeah, you know it's it's less that, and I think one thing important that Josh said is enabling an experience. I think a lot of times as we look at new technologies in general and and how brands can activate against them, there is often kind of this blinding effect of like oh it's a cool new technology and look at what it the cool things it can do without thinking about the consumer experience. So what, what can that technology enable for the consumer? How can it enable more connection with fans and with the players? How can it enable discovery? So it's like, what's the new experience that it can create? Not just how does it make an existing experience better, I think is where um, the real opportunity is and what, what brands are all trying to figure out. Another piece of data, I wrote this down because it shocked me, uh, that, that you guys pulled together. Uh, for the Super Bowl this year, uh, there, there were more fans that were excited to watch the commercials than they were to watch the game. Yeah. Um, I feel like if I were... I mean, uh, it's unique to the Super Bowl, but yeah. Unique yeah. to the Super Bowl, yeah. sure, but yeah. th that's, that's shocking to me, right? And, and yeah. I, in my mind, that should scare a lot of people that work in this industry, <laughs> right? Uh, walk me through that, that number and how you interpret kind yeah. of the, the, those I two mean, things. Um, we, we basically did research among people who were planning to watch the Super Bowl, and um, yeah, it turned out that more people were uh, excited to see the, the commercials and were fans of the brands that were advertising in the Super Bowl than the two teams that are actually playing. Um, there is a lot of excitement with the team, with the, with the game itself, but um, it just speaks to kind of the cultural conversations and what cultural conversations are surrounding that event. And with the Super Bowl, it, it, it's not just the game, it's not just the players, but it's, it's all the brands that show up with amazing creative. And um, the conversations around the commercials are actually happening well before the game. People are um, Googling to see, you know, what Pepsi's and Doritos is planning. And they talk about it and they share on social about it. And um, it has a real buzz a cultural moment um, beyond just the game. So, so we'll open up to questions in the audience in a little bit, uh, and we'll have a microphone that people can walk up to. Uh, I'm curious what do you guys think of as what's next? Is there, without giving away company secrets or, or whatever, what, 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 are, what are the, the new frontiers? What are you looking at product innovation-wise, data-wise, team-wise, whatever it is? What, what, what do you think we're talking about at South by in, in 12 months? That's probably the toughest question to answer, um, but one that I think we're trying to answer through uh, through our accelerator program. Um, we have an accelerator program where we invest in 10 early stage startups on an annual basis, and I think part of that is hoping to um, that you know one of those companies we end up investing in uh, will help show us the next new thing. What, Fatula, I'm curious, what do you think? Um, well, I, mine's a little less sports related and more really around fandom, but we're really interested in understanding how soul cultures activate and as brands or teams think about 
how um, you expand your fan base. It's really about tapping into those different subcultures and engaging them through those, their interests and finding ways to, as a brand or as a team, to activate those subcultures within your own ecosystem. So it's um, a space that we're really looking to understand. Uh, I actually realized, Josh, I wanted to ask you this before. You have a really interesting startup story about how, uh, of how Around got started. I, would, I think there's some people out here that would actually like to hear the, the origin story of how I, Around went from idea to, to company. Great. Um, yeah, when Ryan was up introducing us, uh, he mentioned Stagwell, which is a large agency holding company, some of the best agencies in the world. Um, I, I was within one of those agencies. Um, before that, I was an entrepreneur, and I had kind of the nebulous of this idea, but it was just too big for one person to kind of take on. So with Stagwell, they have this internal shark tank where thir all 13,000 employees can submit ideas and then uh, have that idea be funded. And um, this uh, product was funded uh, er and it was a slightly different form. Is before I talked to Chris, it was really going after the idea of who owns the augmented version of a physical space and how can we make sure Facebook doesn't own it. Huh. Um, and so it was really thinking about how we can find ways for people to uh, invest and innovate into AR of their own space to really kind of start to bring this uh, ecosystem up. What we realized is it was way too diffused um, to kind of go after the world, and so we really have to, had to go where the audiences are. You know, sports was kind of one of the first stops, and in that stop, we realized the need of trying to capture younger audiences and fill that downtime. Um, and that's, you know, the, the Shark Tank allowed that idea to be able to breathe a little bit and to form itself, and it kind of formed in, from augmented reality at large to really uh, first of its kind of fan engagement. And, you know, I think that we start here, but this is something that plays well with concerts, with amusement parks, and you know, w w with most shared spaces. I was watching an interview that you did at CES last year, and you said something that I thought was really interesting, that VR is isolating, but AR is a shared experience. Um, and I'm curious if you could explain that a, a little bit more, because it seems really relevant to sports, right? That so much of sports fandom is shared, right? Yep. It's, one of, it's one of the main reasons I think that most people feel that way is that it's, it, it's something that they can relate to, family members, friends, et cetera. Um, yeah, it, it, VR obviously is something that was very hot for a while and who knows what the future is, um, but, but it does seem like you're thinking about your product a bit differently than that. Yeah, we really are focused on bringing people together. Um, it's my belief that with VR, it's an isolating experience. It is really hard to make those <coughs> connections with other people because you don't know who's on the other end of that. Um, a lot of augmented reality today is also self-focused. It's just kind of pointing back at you. Um, and we see the opportunity to turn AR from a novelty to necessity when you kind of flip that camera around. When you can start to connect with the people, places, and shared passions around us and really bring those worlds together so you can kind of interact and you know, have these experiences that are shared, are purposeful, um, but are community. Based. And we're seeing research community is so critical to building fandom. It's all about the connection. Um, and it's, you know, just the headwinds of today's trends. I mean, there is so much coming out of COVID. There's so much more isolation. We've heard about the loneliness epidemic. Gen Z is looking for community more than they ever have before. And um, there's real opportunity to with digital spaces, with, with the technology that you're building to bring people together. And, and we really believe that fandom is going to um, get big by being small, by making these really small, tight connections with, with people that share some of the same passions, and that's enabled today in ways that hasn't ever been enabled before. And it's so much more important for Gen Z and the future generation. So yeah, community and connection is, is such a big part of fandom. We made it 40 minutes in without, I think, saying the word metaverse, but I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it right now, uh, because Chris, you guys, I, I think you were the, the first sport, we were sports the team first. to do a, a, a metaverse uh, 
experiment, uh, event. Uh, just walk us through what, sure, what yeah. led up to that and, and what, what the learnings were from it. Yeah, yeah, so the Minnesota Twins were the first team to do a metaverse activation, a public-facing metaverse activation. This was in uh, February of 2021. It was before Mark Zuckerberg had said the term metaverse, so that term was not even in the zeitgeist. Back in the time. Facebook era? Yeah, so yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it was called, yeah, it was back in the Facebook days. Um, it was called Twins XR, um, and we actually did two activations with it. We did uh, twin, uh, Twins XR, a Hall of Fame experience in which we built out uh, a locker room based uh, world uh, that we invited our, our fans into to, to you know, uh, immerse themselves in Twins history in a way that had never been done before. Now at the time, if you think to you know February of 2021, we're in the height of the pandemic. People are super sick of uh, virtual events. Um, at, we were looking for a way to, to somehow replace uh, Twins Fest, which is our, our largest annual fundraiser for the Minnesota Twins Community Fund, an in-person event. Um, obviously couldn't do that, so we thought, why don't we try uh, this XR uh, concept and, and see how that resonates with fans. So we launched that in, in February of 2021, um, and we launched, uh, which was admittedly uh, probably aimed at an older audience, mistakenly so. Um, but the second iteration was Twins XR, The Art of Baseball, uh, which was a very younger fan-focused uh, uh, activation. We launched our first NFT within that activation. It was when NFTs were pretty much at the top of the Gartner hype cycle. Um, so uh, yeah, we were the first team in the metaverse and, uh, with two activations in, in 2021. And, and what, what were the main learnings from that? Were you yeah. early? Were you? Did you time it perfectly? Uh, we were early. Yeah, we were definitely early on that one. It was it was ahead of its time. Where I, I would say what we did with Josh was like exactly right on time. Um, I think what we did there was ahead of its time. But I think the learnings from that made it it well worth it. Um, and and just being able to stake a claim that yeah we were the first professional sports team to invite fans into the metaverse uh, has opened doors for us these days that uh, that have provided value that could could not have been foreseen at the time. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, I do want to make sure we do get to questions. So if folks have them, um, there's a microphone. Uh, oh, right up here. So if people want to, or do you want you to move it? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, we'll put it in the middle of the room, and uh, yeah, if folks have questions. Uh, feel free to hop up and uh, ask away. We've got one brave yeah, soul. Yeah, he's <laughs> very confidently two. striding two. down the path here. <laughs> uh, I'm a Minnesota Twins fan, so hey, look at that. very Thank interested you. in this. I don't think I quite got the experience of what it, what did the user experience using around. I, maybe I missed it, but nope, as a didn't. fan, I'm in the stadium. Maybe you could just share what the experience Thanks is. for that question, Jeremy. I mean, that, that is our biggest challenge, is we are a net new idea, and so people have no reference to kind of what this is. So imagine that you're, you're in your seat, you pick up your phone, and right away we can localize you. And then with that, we are able to bring real-time shared experiences, augmented experiences onto the field that everybody has seen at the same time. Uh, it, also, there's shared interaction, so you can throw stuff on the field. The person next to you can see you throwing that stuff on the field. So it's really making this medium fully interactable, fully two-way. Um, we have a team app that, is, that goes alongside it that is, allows for these real-time experiences to coincide with the events on the field. So if there's a hit, you know, we can kind of have a fantastic hit effect that's going on. And it's pretty incredible to see these kids who before they'd be pulling their parents after the second inning for more Dippin' Dots. And you know, the parents are like, I spent $200 on these tickets, and I'm not seeing this game. With this, you know, the kids are involved, they're excited, they're entertained. Um, we brought contests and gamification into it, like a batter up where when you hit the ball, you could see it soar out of, out of the, the stadium. And so it's really starting to blend the feelings of you know, gamification into fully immersive type experiences. The thing that was really grabbing fans was was the home run derby thing he just described. I'm, I go up to bat against TC Bear, I hit a home run, and I'm shown the perspective of my home run flying out of the stadium from where I'm sitting within that context, which was pretty amazing. Plus, we had some awesome prizing to go with it. We were giving away autographed bats to the the you know person who got the highest score, um, and so like we were seeing people spend 25 minutes on average on on the app, which that's more 
time than there is actual action in a baseball game. So like, it's, <laughs> like I mean, these are just facts. I'm not I'm not ragging on our game. Yeah, these are facts. Hey, Rob, yeah. Rob Manfred's calling for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for, for the record. I think he stole my Cameron Indoor Stadium anecdote. You better fess up. Like that's I've been saying that on the podcast for I, years. Dude. I did not steal that. I was at the, the South kid, Carolina the Upstate game, game in November. I, don't know. I, think, I think he stole it from me. <laughs> Macro level for anyone who wants to answer. Do owners, and I think you, you're kind of there already, but do owners have to change their mindset? And that sports franchises should be viewed as like tech media companies where there better be a really big line item for R&D, because if you don't have it, you're just going to fall behind. Everybody's looking at me. I, um, yeah, I, I will say yes, and, and we are fortunate to have owners that, that recognize that. We are, we are not a sports team. Yeah, we play sports, but we are absolutely a media company. We are a lifestyle brand. We are much bigger than baseball, um, and we are much bigger than the Twin Cities. Um, so uh, I think the, the sports teams that embrace that notion and that mentality will be the sports teams that you see gain relevancy over the next decade here. And follow up then, do you view the Bally situation you're in Bally's North, I believe. Yeah. Do you kind of salivate and say, this is an opportunity for us to think different, think new, and all right, we'll figure it out, but you seem to kind of enjoy that. Oof. That one's pretty sticky, so I'm going to steer, <laughs> I'm going to steer well clear of that one, but it is very intriguing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. So I got dragged to the session, but I'm super glad that my friend right here dragged me to it. So, um, yeah, this is great. I just had a quick question about like feedback loops. I'm kind of curious like what that looks like in your industry and like how you kind of harness those second order insights. Yeah, I mean for us with the new product, it, it is first trying to understand what is working for what audience. Um, and it's a little bit difficult in the space because there's so much data that we can capture but we want to be really sensitive uh, here. Um, and so we've been a little bit conservative in terms of how we're capturing. Um, we're capturing a lot in terms of engagement because you know that that is the thing that uh, the, the teams are kind of most interested in. Um, a, a lot of it is a little bit anecdotal too, being on the ground and, and kind of seeing how this starts to resonate. I mean, we, we really weren't focused on the tween teen market initially. We thought casual fan fanatic. Um, that being there in stadium kind of opened that up. Um, and then you know we're really interested to see how we can really take this to the fanatic, bringing next gen stats in and really thinking about the in-person as their own broadcast producer and you know all, all that is related to how people are absorbing it because we have no reference. Thank you. Yeah. How you doing guys? Great session. Uh, my name's Ando. I am founder of a, another AR tech company uh, called Happening. My question is quite specific um, but indulge me for a second. Where are you on companies such as Josh pitching ideas that are, say, white label solutions to integrate into your existing infrastructure versus sort of standalone, standalone pieces of functionality or standalone apps that also provide value for your fans. Is there a preference or? That, that is also a very loaded question because of the nature of our re relationship with, uh, with Major League Baseball. So we have an established app strategy. So standalone apps are kind of tough to stomach because it does disrupt a, a pretty um, established strategy. Ideally, we want things to be living through our, our apps. So we are doing the, the data capture that our, uh, the, the question before you mentioned. Um, that said, if the tech is intriguing, enough, um, it's worth pushing on. And, and that's um, admittedly one of the challenges we're facing with Josh right now is, is it's a great product. It's a great concept. We've seen the level of engagement it brings, um, but it does exist outside of the league's established app strategy. So how do we marry those two things is kind of the role I see myself as playing. Fantastic. Thank you. Do you mind if I give you a demo? Off Please. I would love. I would love a demo. Yes. And by the way, that, that's that's a good example. I think of. We talked about the difference between leagues. I think you might get a different answer if you talk to someone at a different at a team at a different league that didn't Certainly. have Major League Baseball's kind of unified structure around digital rights and things like that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, representing Nike, but all thoughts and questions are my own. Um, <laughs> so we uh, we're obsessed with sports. We want to see kids outside playing 
Um, and we also understand that the nature of this generation is everyone on this panel, and you want to blend the two. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, the relationship of physical play and joy of playing that sport coming to life by being a fan and experiencing it as digital natives. I would say there's no greater predictor of fandom than having played a sport as as a youth, and which is why we put so much effort into our, our youth programs locally. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll say that again. There's no greater predictor of lifelong fandom than someone who has played the game. Um, so we do put a lot of efforts there. Um, but also with the rise of esports, um, there are, you know, some kids that are, are not necessarily going to be playing, uh, you know, the sport physically, but might be interested in it from an esports perspective. And, you know, who am I to say that's wrong or right? Yeah. Do you think there's a difference between a 22-year-old who played baseball his whole life and a 22-year-old who played MLB The Show his whole life in terms of their love for baseball? Not really, no. Sure. Well, when I'll add to uh, with um, the research that we do on fandom, one of the big drivers of fandom is is a memorable experience. So when a, and when a brand or an experience creates a memory, um, that often can be that spark that creates uh, some, a lifelong fan that kind of tips you into that casual fan to a lifelong fan. So I would imagine that those in-person experiences, um, participating in the sports themselves are really great predictors for creating that memory that people just hold on to and solidify that fandom. So I think there's a place for everything, but yeah, the in-person is, is quite strong as well. From the technology side, I, I would say that our focus is really trying to couple the education with the entertainment so people become more understanding of the sport. Um, they become more appreciative of it. They have more connections to make. And, and it's really thinking about making it more accessible. And, and so whether that's through the education, the gamification, or the ability to take these experiences and bring them to the at-home user so they have that energy and excitement you know, it, it, that the stadium is giving, even if they can't you know, pay to go there. And I think that's an important part, is really trying to find ways to kind of take these things that are getting more pricey, but make them more accessible for a broader audience. And you know, it's going to be a, a varied strategy to get to that point. Thank you. So um, I want to th thank the panel. This has been really great. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important is that when you've all spoken about AR and the value of um, that as a shared experience and not being something that's, um, well, VR being more, more of an uh, individual experience, but bringing everybody together and having it be inclusive. It, I think is, is important for us to remember because so many times people, they think about the technology just for the sake of technology and not about the fan and who the person is that, that is going to be at the end of that, um, that feed that will actually be uh, experiencing. I think that's so important. I appreciate you, you all took the time to bring this together and do that. Um, but I actually, uh, my question, I have three quick questions. They're all for Chris. Oh, man. Um, Popular I'm guy. Sweating, you guys. Question, so much one is, was it the dip in revenue from your last Ant-Man movie that made you decide to leave acting for baseball? <laughs> <laughs> question number two is, do former Paul Rudd fans find it interesting that you're working for the team named The Twins? And my final question is, anyone noticed that the shuffling of your last name, your new last name, reveals the joke for the fans in the know? Chris lies. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh, uh, I assume you've gotten that before. Uh, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> I have thought it. But I've never. I've never heard it verbal. Definitely a, co yeah. definitely a compliment. Yeah. Definitely a yeah. compliment. Yeah. Kind of a hard, hard act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, sh I'm just talking about AR, and I'm sure there's big sponsors behind it, obviously, making that available, and, c and twins and other companies investing in it. Have you guys thought about how you can monetize it in the future? Would it be paid access, or what's the future of it on that side? Yeah, I think it's it's too early to think about paid access. I think you have to first and foremost drive adoption before that, which makes sponsorship the obvious model out of the gate. Um, certainly open to other models, but I have I have yet to see you know people willing to pay for that type of experience. Yes. Um, I hope we can get there, um, but we're not we're we're not there today, and we probably won't be there for five years. Yeah. 
And have you guys seen anything within soccer or like the MLS world when it comes to AR? I haven't seen so much. I was wondering if you can guide me there. I, I think FIFA did some pretty incredible stuff. <laughs> yeah, FIFA. Yeah. Video game, yeah. yeah. So, I, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're talking to teams in all leagues. Um, a, a big part is understanding how we can fit into that experience. Um, you know, MLS is different from European football, and you know, it, but all of that is about being able to express your fandom, your excitement, and really feel that you're being a part of it. And so, I think all those things are commonalities that exist across sports. Um, but then there's you know nuances. How we turn that downtime into an uptime is kind of that okay. the part that varies. Casey, I'm with Visa. I used to be fun. I was in NFL and PGA Tour, so I was cool. I won't be you still seem cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you, like, just in working with AR and VR companies in the past, generally it's super expensive for a sports team to kind of pour their funds into that basket. How are you seeking ways to extend the value of that activation in other parts of your marketing life cycle? Good question. Um, I don't know exactly how to answer it um, because in a lot of cases, I, I go for the first mover discount is, <laughs> is generally how I, I try to negotiate a lot of uh, deals with you know, tech like this. Um, so uh, I don't really know how to answer the rest of it. I, I'll try to. Um, yeah, the, the, the thing with teams is we think that they have all this money because they're paying these players so much. But that's kind of getting pulled out of every other uh, coffer. So, you know, what we what we really want to do is make sure that we were efficient enough to drive experiences that catered towards the fan. I'm sure people have seen mixed reality, um, you know, like uh, a lot of what the famous group does with Chipotle or um, Gillette, and those are really expensive and they are really limiting in terms of what they offer. But the the ability to bring down that price really disrupts it, makes it so you can cater towards individual fans. You can really create almost uh, in-game channels that really bring, delivers personalized experiences for these audiences, which again, hopefully makes them feel better connected, more part of the community, and more entertained. Oh. Uh, Josh, I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, the form factor of this is eventually gonna be this, right? So five years, 10 years, do you, can you talk about how you think about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, head warm will definitely come into play. I mean, we can already bring uh, our experience to the living room. And so we're, we already are thinking about how we can take the energy and excitement in stadium and really expand that across the board. Uh, when it comes to head worn though, um, it's gonna be very situational. Um, personally, I think that Apple's gonna go after the living room because it's a safe space, they can control the content and they already have a conduit through their Apple TV. Um, but safe spaces are gonna be really important for headborne. People aren't gonna walk down the street with it. But the stadium is a safe space, and there's a lot of experiences that can be brought into it as well. So as we think our strategy for headborne, I mean, it's really where we're already cr crafting our own products. And so it's really thinking about how we can have a killer app that exists kind of before that comes out, so we're prepared for it. So in some future, the Phil Knight photo, everyone just has glasses on and, and no one's offended. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> Got it. Hey, uh, curious on the metaverse that you did. Was that a standalone uh, application or was that in an existing metaverse experience with distribution that's built in? Yeah, it was a standalone application. Okay. So, um, yeah. And when you think of future activations like that, would you still do that approach or would you go more towards built-in distribution? You know, I would have to think about that a little more. That's a tough question for me to answer right now. Um, you know, there's something about owning your own audience and owning your own mm -hmm. space that is really intriguing but, um, but limiting at the same time. So um, I hope that's a good non-answer for you. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right, well, I think that's it for us. Uh, Chris, Josh, Fatula, thank you very much, and thank you all for, uh, for tuning in.